Hi, Pastor John. Uh, my name is Brandon, and I'm a student at UCLA. Good. Uh, my question is, uh, could you clarify the roles of the persons of the Trinity and prayer, and is there a biblical basis to pray to the Holy Spirit or Jesus? Your statement highlights two important aspects of Christian belief and practice, the nature of prayer and the responsibility of raising godly children. Here's a more detailed look at these points. Believers have the privilege and right to pray to each member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is based on the understanding that all three persons of the Trinity are fully and equally God, and each plays a unique role in the believer's life. There are no limitations on praying to the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, or the Holy Spirit, as they are one in essence and work together in perfect unity. Raising godly children is viewed as a lifelong commitment. Parents are called to teach their children about God's ways, instill righteousness, and model a Christ-centered life. This involves daily practices such as prayer, reading scripture, attending church, and living out biblical principles. The goal is to pass on the faith and values to the next generation, ensuring that they grow up knowing and loving God. Yeah, the question is um, clarify the role of the Trinity. Uh, that's a little beyond my pay grade. Uh, the Trinity is an impossible, divine, um, incomprehensible reality. It's, it's beyond my ability to grasp fully. But I can explain the answer to your question with regard to prayer, uh, how are we to think about the Trinity? I think Scripture gives us every right to pray to every member of the Trinity. I don't think that uh, there are any limitations. In fact, you can find illustrations in the Bible of praying to the Father. Um, there are clear words, pray to the Father in My name from the Son, and uh, that's in, in John's gospel in the upper room. And then you have a statement made uh, by the Apostle Paul in Romans 8 about how the, that we, we're to, the Holy Spirit is, is making groanings. Um, which are unutterable before the Father on behalf of His will for us, and we are told to pray in the Spirit, capital S. So I, I don't think you, I don't think there's any limitations. We, we, we can worship the Holy Spirit and must. We worship the Son and must. We worship the Father and we must do that. We worship the triune God. We honor the, the triune God. We, we, we have a right to speak to every member of the Trinity to... Um, to give worship to every member of the Trinity, and even to cry out to, uh, to each member of the Trinity. I, I don't think there are any limitations at all in Scripture that would uh, cause us to have some kind of necessary pecking order or hierarchy that we have to work through. Praying to the Holy Spirit involves seeking guidance, comfort, and empowerment for living a godly life. The Holy Spirit is often invoked for wisdom and strength in the believer's daily walk. Scriptures like Deuteronomy 6, 6, 7 and Proverbs 22. 6, 7 and Proverbs 22, 6 emphasize the importance of teaching children God's commandments and ways. Ephesians 6, 4 instructs fathers, and by extension parents, to bring up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. Parents are encouraged to be role models of faith and righteousness, demonstrating a godly lifestyle through their actions, decisions, and relationships. By focusing on these principles, believers aim to cultivate a strong, enduring faith in their children and foster a deep personal relationship with each member of the Trinity. You know, to talk about analogies of the Trinity, uh, we have to start just with a, a couple minutes on thinking about what the Trinity is and what, what, how we should think of it. And I think the simplest way to put this is we really uh, ought to think of the doctrine of the Trinity as being upheld by two pillars. Uh, one of them, one of those pillars that upholds the doctrine uh, might be called the distinction pillar, where Father, Son, and Spirit are distinct from each other. So it's not the case that Father, Son, and Spirit are three names for the same person. Like I'm Bruce, I'm Mr. Ware, and I'm Jody's husband. So those are three names for the same person. But actually, Father 
is a distinct person from Son, and Son a distinct person from Holy Spirit. So distinction is one of the pillars. The other pillar is the unity or equality pillar in which the Father, Son, and Spirit share together the one identical divine nature. So they're equally God because each possesses fully the one divine nature. So so bear in mind, this this means they don't possess, Father, Son, and Spirit don't possess merely one-third of the divine nature, but, but rather the whole divine nature is possessed by the Father, the whole divine nature by the Son, the whole divine nature by the Spirit. One divine nature, that is the the collection, as it were, of all of the essential attributes of God possessed fully by the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And yet, Father, Son, and Spirit are distinct personal expressions of that one God. So God is one and three uh, in the doctrine of the Trinity. It is possible for religious people to be self-deceived believing they have a genuine relationship with God when they may lack true spiritual light and understanding of the gospel. This can lead to a false sense of assurance about their salvation and spiritual standing. True spiritual light involves a deep, transformative understanding of the gospel. It goes beyond mere intellectual assent to the doctrines of Christianity. It includes a heartfelt acceptance and a life changed by the Holy Spirit. Now, in the middle of this, I already mentioned this. Right in the middle of all this, in chapter 48, God gives the best verses about the Trinity. Look at chapter 48 and verse 16. 48, 16. Come near to me and hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Okay, quiz. Everybody quiz. Here's an oral quiz. Who is talking in verse 16? Who is the me? If it's the Lord God, that's God the Father, and his spirit, that's God the Spirit, who's left? Yeah. All three of them are here. Now look at this. I I want you to see this. God is the Father. God is the Son. God is the Holy Spirit. But the Son is not the Holy Spirit. They're two separate persons. The Son is not the Father. They're two separate persons. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. I love this drawing. This is from Wayne Grudem, the the theologian, the systematic theologian I was telling you about. But God is the Son. And God is the Spirit. And God is the Father. And there aren't three gods, there's one God, but he eternally exists in three persons. The gospel message is central to Christian faith, emphasizing salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, repentance from sin, and a personal relationship with God. True understanding of the gospel leads to genuine faith and transformation. People may rely on external religious practices, moral behavior, or church membership for their assurance of salvation. However, These can be misleading if they are not accompanied by a true living faith in Christ. The Bible contains several warnings about self-deception. For example, in Matthew 7, 21, 23, Jesus speaks about those who will claim to have done great works in his name, but will be told, I never knew you. This passage highlights the importance of a true relationship with Christ over mere religious activities. The Apostle Paul encourages believers to examine themselves to see if they are in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. This involves self-reflection, prayer, and seeking confirmation of one's faith through the witness of the Holy Spirit and alignment with Scripture. By focusing on these principles, believers can safeguard against self-deception and cultivate a genuine, transformative relationship with God. 